Folks, we're going to get started. Good evening. And welcome to uh, the MassDOT presentation of its uh, capital investment plan 2014 to 2018 and the, T, the MBTA's capital investment plan 2015 to 2019, which is why you see up there FY14 to FY19. So it is two five-year plans, just one starting uh, at a different time than the other. I'll get, uh, we'll get more into that in a moment. Uh, it's a little awkward for me to sit here like this, but I hope you don't, if you don't mind, I don't mind. My name is Dana Levinson. I'm Assistant Secretary and Chief Financial Officer for MassDOT. Uh, I'm joined up here by Steve Rodding from the Aeronautics Division, Brian Fallon from District 4 Highway, Charles Plank, uh, who is the Acting Chief of Staff for the General Manager of the MBTA, and Scott Hamway is somewhere nearby, uh, who is Senior Planner from the Office of Transportation Planning. Um, this evening, uh, we are going to go through uh, the details uh, of the CIPs. Again, that's the acronym for Capital Investment Plan. Um, and if you think of it in three parts, uh, or four parts, it is, uh, they are as follows. We're gonna talk about MassDOT, the traditional MassDOT, which is the highway, RMV, aeronautics, and rail and transit. My colleague to my left, Charles Plank, is going to talk about the MBTA's Capital Investment Plan. Scott Hamway is going to discuss uh, the We Move Massachusetts metric tool that applies to both the MBTA as well as the, uh, uh, as well as MassDOT. And then afterwards, we are going to open it up for comments and questions. Uh, if you are planning on uh, making a comment or, uh, or have a question, I hope you have a number. If you don't, at the end, we'll ask people who don't have numbers if they want to make a comment or ask a question. They're more than welcome to do so. So that's the format for the evening. Whether that takes us fully till 8 o'clock or not is hard to say. Uh, that depends a lot on you. We aren't going to do all that much talking. Uh, we are here, frankly, to listen. Uh, we're here to listen to your comments. Uh, the CIP is in draft form. It's available on our website, and we, will, and we can also get you a physical copy as, uh, if necessary. Uh, this Wednesday at the... Uh, MassDOT board meeting, which is the board of both the Ma of MassDOT and uh, the MBTA, uh, it will be proposed and voted upon uh, as the capital investment plan for the next five years. Um, I think it's important to, notice, to note that when it comes to the capital investment plan, uh, there is a little bit of lack of harmony, to you, for, for lack of a better term, uh, because again, the T's uh, capital investment plan, the TCIP, is from 2015 to 2019, and MassDOTS is from 2014 to 2018, and I'm referring to our fiscal years. Uh, once this plan uh, is adopted in final form, uh, we at fiscal will be putting down our pencils for about an hour, then we're going to pick them up and plan to publish our, fisc our FY15 to 19 CIP on July 1. So at that point, both the T and MassDOT will have the same dates for their uh, financial, for their capital investment plans uh, outstanding. Um, so if you'll bear with me, we'll get started on uh, the presentation. And we're going to start off with a simple definition of what is the capital investment plan. Uh, it is an annual rolling five-year capital program that speaks to capital assets. It speaks to funding of capital assets. This is not the operating budget where we talk about revenues and expenses. What we're talking about here is where is money coming from for the purpose of funding the investment in capital assets. Defi we define capital assets in a very traditional manner. Capital assets are solid. Uh, you can not only see, see them, you can touch them, uh, but they are, uh, they, they exist uh, not just on paper, but they are, they are real assets. Uh, they have a useful economic life that exceeds a year. So therefore, if they, this were the private side, they would be able to depreciate those assets uh, for tax purposes. But since we do not pay taxes, uh, we still look at them as depreciable but in any case, that is what defines a capital asset. Pavement is a capital asset. A guardrail is a capital asset. 
a, uh, a runway is a capital asset. Um, uh, the, RMV's, uh, the RMV's computer system is a capital asset. Uh, certainly rolling stock and, and, uh, and, and locomotives and, uh, and rails are capital assets. We're hopeful that what you will come away with is a transparent, comprehensive plan that it truly is multimodal, that illustrates the total investment and where that investment is funded in public transit, rail, bike paths, paratransit, roads, bridges, airports, roadways, and as it says up there, their sources of funding, whether that be tolls that are collected on the highway, whether that be money coming in from the federal government, whether that money be raised in the bond markets as obligations by the state. Uh, capital expenditures equal capital funding, so you will see as we get into the plan, roughly for, the, for Mass DOT, 12.4 billion over the course of five years in money coming in and 12.4 billion in money going out. Um, that 12.4 billion in terms of the money coming in, we think that is the maximum that would be coming in over the next five years. Now that's all gonna change in July because we're moving out a year. We're gonna drop 2014 and pick up 2019 on the Mass DOT side. But in any case, as long as capital funding equals capital expenditures, that's the right way to present a capital plan. Um, as I said, it represents the outlays associated with hundreds of projects across all modes. And at a certain point in the program, as we're talking about MassDOT, I'm gonna ask my colleagues from Aeronautics and from the Highway Division to just discuss in brief what is it that they see as their capital asset uh, or capital investment over the next five years and what that means uh, to you as users, as taxpayers, uh, as customers of MassDOT. Uh, and I'm sure Charles will do the same thing when it comes to the MBTA. I think it's important also to note that in terms of the overall CIP, 80% of the CIP is going to state of good repair. We are not building new roads. We are not building a whole lot. We are building some. We are, there are some expansion programs that are included in the CIP, but that's only 20% of the 12.4 billion. Uh, and if you look at the uh, T's capital plan, frankly, uh, there's almost no expansion. It's virtually all state of good repair. So, now let's get into the, uh, let's, uh, in, into the heart of the presentation. Well, actually, I'll, I, I want to show you the organiz organization chart for all of transportation in the Commonwealth. It's a little bit difficult to read, but it, ta it speaks to the four operating divisions within MassDOT, plus the MBTA, plus the regional transit authorities. Uh, and the reason why we put it up there is we want to make sure that we drive home the point that transportation in the Commonwealth is looked at as one effort one organization, we all report up through the secretary, including uh, Massport, which we are not talking about tonight because that is a separate authority. Uh, but all modes of transportation, again, as part of the way it's constructed in the Commonwealth, is one department. And we think that that is, adds to the cohesiveness and, that, and to the comprehensiveness of the capital plan and all the other endeavors of transportation within the Commonwealth. So I talked earlier about uh, how Mass DOT and the T look at capital. This is looking at it from the sources. So as you see, the biggest source of funding are state borrowings, and it says 6.37 billion on the lower left. So what that means is that over the course of the next uh, five years, that the Commonwealth will be borrowing 6.37 billion. It has the capacity to do that because there are bonds that are maturing that were issued 25 and 30 years ago. Uh, there's also a revenue calculation that allows us, it's called debt affordability, and it has been determined that as long as the debt service on that 6.37 billion, and debt service is a function of paying that $6.37 billion back, is at or less than 7.5% of total revenues in the state, that that gives us the capacity to be issuing that type of debt. So there's 6.37 billion of state borrowings. 
The next largest uh, chunk you see is from the federal government. That's $2.529 billion. And this is essentially what is the federal government's match. For projects on federally eligible roads, the government is going to, this is assuming no diminution and no increase, that the government over the course of five years will be giving uh, to the, uh, to MassDOT, specifically to the Highway Department, 80% of the cost of those projects, and that's what the 2.525 billion is. We get approximately $540 million in per year, uh, and once you adjust it for certain rounding aspects, that's what it comes out to over the course of five years. But that funds 80% of the projects that are federally eligible, 20% is covered by the state borrowings, and then some. Uh, the third largest uh, uh, slug of capital that we get in uh, into Mass DOT is the accelerated bridge borrowings. And again, we expect those to be approximately 1.7 billion over the next five years. Uh, some of you may have heard of the accelerated bridge program. This is the highly successful, highly touted program that has put a larger percentage of our bridges in better health uh, that are no longer structurally deficient because there was a program that was set up back in, I believe, 2006, if one of my colleagues would correct me if I'm wrong. It ends in 2016, but it will have, I believe it has corrected about 452 structurally deficient bridges throughout the Commonwealth, and it will continue that program. Right now, we're working on the five mega bridges, one of which is the Longfellow in Boston, uh, the Burns Bridge in Worcester, the Four River Bridge, the Fall River Bridge, and the Whittier. Uh, and again, if one of my MassDOT colleagues can correct me because I'm pretty sure I have the details wrong, uh, but those are the five mega projects, and we say they're mega projects because they're roughly at least $80 million each, uh, and in the case of Longfellow, it's well in excess of that. In any case, Accelerator Bridge, which has been written up in national and international uh, uh, journals as being one of the most highly successful uh, bridge programs in the country, uh, that's where that is located in the MassDOT capital plan. You see the, the uh, upper left-hand corner, Mass, the MHS, which is the Mass, uh, Metropolitan Highway System, and the Western Turnpike tolls. That's the net after expenses of money that we collect on the toll, on the toll roads uh, for the purpose of funding the capital maintenance of those roads. Uh, and again, that's just a little over a billion. Um, the FAA is $187 million, and that's for the purpose of improving aeronautics uh, conditions at uh, the general aviation airports throughout the Commonwealth. Steve, how many are there? There are 39, 39 GA airports over which we have uh, jurisdiction for regulation and safety. Is that correct? Um, and uh, that is money, again, that comes in from the government. That covers 90% of the projects. Uh, of the cost of the projects uh, at the, those airports. By the way, when we talk about the general aviation airports, we're not talking about the commercial airports, namely Logan, Hanscom, and Worcester. I don't think I've missed anything else up there, but what we're hopeful, again, that this gives you an idea of where $12.4 billion comes from over the course of five years. Now let's turn to uses, and again, this is within the traditional construct of mass DOT, which again is highway department, aeronautics, rail and transit, and the registry of motor vehicles. Uh, this breaks down that $12.4 billion. You're more than welcome to do the math I already did. I made sure that it all added up to 12.4, but this is the display of the uses of capital. So you saw on the previous slide, this is the sources, this is the uses. It says investment, it's a better term because it truly is an investment in long-term capital assets that are there to serve the Commonwealth taxpayers, users, uh, uh, and the like. Uh, the largest one, of course, is highway, which is $6.534 billion. Um, and this is going into, um, whether it's the tolled roads or the non-tolled roads, uh, the, mass, the Metropolitan Highway System, which is the system primarily east of 128, but it goes to, and we'll get into this a little bit further, it goes into highway assets that are truly throughout the Commonwealth, and we'll show you exactly where that money is going to be spent in one slide. 
Um, the MBTA, and this is money that the state is going to fund, is approximately $3.05 billion. Uh, these are new red line, these are new orange line cars replacing the entire fleet, uh, new orange line cars. Uh, the, mass, uh, ma the T has its own capital program, but this is in addition to what the uh, T has. And the reason for that is that the T is capital constrained uh, and it does what it can. It has its own pr uh, capital investment program that you'll see is roughly $3 billion, uh, but this is adding $3 billion to it. Um, aeronautics, I talked about earlier, that's their spend, $250.2 million over the course of five years. Um, rail and transit, this is non-MBTA rail and transit. Uh, this includes the 15 regional transit authorities uh, for buses, for maintenance facilities, uh, and the like. Um, it also is uh, rail that is not uh, on the MBTA system, uh, such as the Knowledge Corridor, which is in the western part of the state. Bike and ped, it's $130.2 million. Uh, it's more than, than has been spent on, spent on bike and ped in many, many years. Uh, I'm sure there will be some people out there who don't think we're spending enough, but we are glad at least to put up there what we think is a healthy number for bike and ped. Um, municipal projects. Uh, this is uh, what we know is a very, very important number to the 351 uh, uh, cities and towns across the Commonwealth. Um, you can divide this up into two, uh, two parts. There's a billion dollars over the course of five, five years or $200 million per year, and that's for Chapter 90. Uh, Chapter 90 is the program uh, whereby money is uh, funneled to the uh, 351 state and uh, towns and cities across the Commonwealth for the purpose of transportation projects, uh, paving projects, uh, which are absolutely necessary in, the, uh, in, in, in these cities and towns. It is formula driven, it's based on lane miles, based on population, based on a number of different factors. Uh, and it is $200 million uh, per year for five years. There is another $583 million that will be funded uh, also going to the cities and towns uh, which are above and beyond the Chapter 90 program. Shared services at the top, uh, this is, even though it's one of the smaller numbers, it's one of the most interesting numbers. This is $268.7 million, which will be spent on capital projects throughout the Commonwealth. Um, this also brings to an end the practice of financing our capital on our credit card. Uh, what we've been doing for uh, many years, uh, we have, uh, excuse me, financing operations on the credit card. Uh, what we've been doing for many years is we've been paying for capital programs, uh, we, excuse me, we've been paying for operating expenses from the capital bond. Uh, that is considered to be an imprudent practice, to say the least, and the, le the state legislature has mandated that we stop that practice, and this is the effect that we'll have that capacity of $268 million in FY14, in FY, uh, 14 through FY18 to be able to end that practice. This is the equivalent of going to the supermarket using your credit card to pay for your food and then when the bill comes not paying it off but simply paying the finance charge and a little bit of the principal. Uh, you end up paying a lot more money for that food. We end up paying a lot more money for these salaries, rents and utilities, all of which need to be paid for by current revenues and not by capital uh, expenditures, or not by capital bonds, I should say. That covers the $12.4 billion uh, when it in terms of how much is going to be, where it's going to be invested. Uh, again, sources and uses. The T does the same thing, and I'm going to ask Charles, Pl Charles Plank in a moment, but what I'd like to, do, to talk about the T's capital investment pr uh, plan, but what I'd like to do is turn this over to my colleagues, um, Steve Routing and Brian, F uh, Brian Fallon, just to discuss for a couple of minutes what exactly it is on a day-to-day -day basis they're doing when it comes to capital. Steve, I'll start with you from Aeronautics. Sure. Hi. Can everyone hear me? This is, this is live. Great. And in North Shore here, we're investing in the... Uh, the local airports that you, everybody in the North Shore maybe thinks of Logan, but we also have Beverly, Lawrence, and Plum Island. 
Those are, those are public use general aviation airports, and we're presently involved in improving them. As Dana says, we're making sure they're in a state of good repair. In other words, reconstruction and improving projects there. Beverly, we presently uh, have been working on both aprons. There's the east side and west side of the airport. Improving the west side apron is presently underway starting this spring. And then uh, in the following out years, we'll be reconstructing the, the main runway, which is the runway 1634. Uh, that presently, right now, the two aprons are about a $5 million project, of which the FAA is picking up 80% of the money. The state is picking up 5%, and the municipality, such as Beverly, is picking up 5%. Lawrence is currently improving their runway safety areas. Runway safety areas are defined as that area at the end of each runway, which is hard, hard packed gravel or grass. So if there's an overrun or overshoot, there's a little margin of error. Uh, the Congress mandated that airports that have uh, primary runways like Lawrence or Beverly have a runway safety area at the end of each runway. And then also at Plum Island, Plum Island, we're presently working on a crack seal and repair, keeping that pavement in good state of repair. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, as I asked Brian to talk about what District 4 and what the districts do in general, I turn to a slide which tells you what the districts are. District 1 is furthest west. District 2 is essentially Springfield, north and south. District 3 is Worcester, north and south. We're in District 4. District 5 is the South Shore, and District 6 is the metropolitan Boston area. Um, Brian is in District 4, uh, where you can see it's one of the larger spends. I think it's the second highest. But Brian, if you don't mind, if you could give an overview, uh, like Steve did, about what it is to be doing highway projects in terms of their scope, the size, the number, et cetera. Right, uh, that's true. I work in uh, the District 4 office which is approximately, I want to say it's 61 cities and towns in the northeast part of Massachusetts. I work in the uh, design section, and on a good year, we're going to look at uh, 120 uh, municipally designed projects. We review them for accuracy and standards, and we um, review them and, and with the uh, intention that Mass DOT is going to construct these projects in various uh, cities and towns. Uh, also in the district design section, we um, uh, every year we uh, handle interstate maintenance contracts, which, again, they're the, the larger highway contracts. They're usually between 10 and $20 million each. We'll probably do two or three of those a year. And what we look at is obviously the pavement surface, um, safety features like guardrail and treatments, um, Jersey barrier, things like that. We're just trying to maintain our uh, roadways and keep them as safe as possible and you know, use as much uh, safety features as we can. Uh, we've been kind of looking at uh, smaller, minor state routes with the ideas to improve them also. And usually what we look at is uh, bicycle accommodation and uh, pedestrian issues. We try to add uh, uh, access ramps and you know, widen shoulders where we can or restripe the roadway so um, some more pavement area could be dedicated towards bicycles. Uh, that's the design section. I know in our maintenance section, they're the people you see on a day-to-day -day basis. They're the people in the trucks driving on the state highway, basically maintaining, fixing uh, problems. And certainly in this season, uh, snow and ice operations is a large part of their day-to-day uh, -day activity. Construction, I really can't give you a hard number on how many, how the dollar value on the construction projects we have, but it's, it's very large. We run from uh, the Whittier Bridge project, which I believe is around $250 million project to smaller intersection projects, which could be in the neighborhood of $100,000 or $200,000. So again, the district is pretty much the uh, the day-to-day -day operations aspect of uh, Mass DOT. And um, basically, that's that's a, an overview of what we do there. And you get no toll money from what I understand, correct? And that is because you have no toll roads running through your district. They go straight from District 3 into uh, into District 6. Right. And toll tolls that are collected on the Tolls, uh, toll roads, must that money must stay on the toll roads by law. So at this point, I'm going to turn this over to uh, my colleague Charles Plank, again the acting acting C uh, chief of staff for the general manager of the MBTA, uh, to discuss uh, the MBTA's capital investment plan. Good evening. Thank you, Dana. Uh, just want to spend a moment on this slide. This is essentially a subset of the other pie chart that Dana walked through uh, for all of state funding. A couple of keys here are that we continue to do our best to secure money from the Federal Transit Administration. 
uh, the large blue circle to the bottom left, large blue pie slice to the bottom left, is uh, $2.3 billion or 39 percent of our funding from the Federal Transit Administration. That is a critical source of funding for us. News out of Washington is usually not um, encouraging, but we continue to do our best to, to secure funding for, for Federal funding for projects, uh, which allows us to stretch our State funding further. Um, we do have additional State funding represented in the yellow portion of the pie above. Uh, as a result of the transportation finance legislation that was passed this summer. So we are very thankful for that and thankful for that and allows us uh, to do a couple of expansion projects and a couple of large state of good repair projects that we have been wanting to do. Next slide. Uh, this gives an idea of how the capital spending, spending is projected to be spent across the modes. You will see the, the two largest uh, pieces of, of the pie are the green line. Most of that is the extension of the green line into Medford and um, Somerville and Medford that will be occurring over the next several years. That is 27 percent of the total picture. Uh, and the second largest piece is commuter rail with the expansion uh, work that is beginning for commuter rail service to Fall River, New Bedford, but also more directly the uh, inclusion of 42 new locomotives and 75 new bi-level coaches that will be used throughout the system. Those coaches, uh, those new fleet uh, vehicles are not dedicated to any one particular line. They will be benefiting customers throughout the system. Um, and then next slide, please. This slide uh, may be a little difficult to read but it, uh, from a distance, but it gives you an idea of how the projects are broken down by type of spend. Uh, again, the largest piece at the top there is, is State funding to support the, ex the two principal expansion projects, the Green Line and commuter rail to Fall River, New Bedford. Um, the second largest piece is really critical. The red and orange line vehicles that are included in this capital uh, plan are vital projects that we have been working on for some years to secure. One third of the Red Line fleet, about 74 vehicles, date to 1969. We intended, to, we should have replaced those in 1994. Our maintenance staff have been doing a tremendous job keeping those vehicles on the on in service uh, every day, but it's they're well past due to replace. So that would be one third of the Red Line fleet, dating from 1969, uh, replaced. And on the Orange Line, the entire fleet of 120 vehicles dates to 1981. We will be replacing that fleet in its entirety and, in fact, expanding the fleet from 120 to 152 vehicles. So we will be able to expand capacity significantly on the Orange Line once those vehicles are here. All of those vehicles will be built in Massachusetts. Uh, that procurement is now just starting, so you will be hearing news about that as project teams uh, present their bids to the MBTA uh, and select sites where they can do final assembly here in Massachusetts. Uh, we are very excited about that, creating jobs, long-term jobs, we hope, uh, for vehicle manufacture in our state. Uh, the rest of the project items are, are, um, are principally what we call state of good repair, that is keeping service uh, well functioning, safe and functioning at a high level so that it provides reliable service to our customers. Um, enhancements is a catch-all category for anything that doesn't fit in the several categories um, below. Um, uh, bridges is very important. Bridges aren't always a very exciting project for, for us to hear about, but they're absolutely essential. And if you've been across a bridge with a 5 or 10 mile an hour speed restriction on it on a highway or a truck restriction on it, um, the same thing happens on the rail side. When we need to, when a bridge is uh, in, in aging condition, we need to slow the trains down or restrict the number of trains that can operate on that bridge, and that has an immediate impact on our customers. Uh, so the bridge spending is very important for us. Uh, the number of other categories there that, again, relate to state of good repair of our vehicles and will improve customer, customer um, satisfaction and, and safety on our system. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, if this number were a lot higher or this number were a lot higher, which means we would have more money coming in for more projects, we would not need this slide, but we do because $12.4 billion is capacity for mass DOT. It's roughly $3.3 billion for the MBTA. Um, so we have, we have to watch every dollar. And I want to ask Scott Hamway to discuss exactly what is the methodology for watching every dollar to make sure that we get the biggest bang for our buck when it comes to spending $12.4 billion uh, on capital investment. Uh, so, Scott, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I'll be glad to switch slides when you want. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dana. Uh, my name is Scott Hamway with MassDOT Planning, and just talk briefly about the WeMove process, as Dana mentioned. Uh, about a month ago, we released the draft WeMove Massachusetts report uh, at the same time the CIP draft was released. This report is a, uh, it's a federally, it serves essentially as our federally required uh, statewide strategic 
a multimodal plan, and it's been in the works for a couple years. It's it's been the product of a very extensive civic engagement effort. We started a couple years ago with a, about a dozen uh, workshops that we held all around the state. Um, we had a very innovative, uh, we thought innovative, interactive mapping tool on our website that allowed our customers to go on and identify the locations of specific, you know, mobility challenges or issues that they were having, and and those in turn could be viewed by other users of the site. Uh, more recently, we've done some more uh, targeted uh, stakeholder events where we've tried to ensure uh, that the interests and perspectives of envir environmental justice uh, communities have been well represented as part of this uh, as part of this effort. And the result has been a, a strategic plan that's that's been less about specific projects and more about performance uh, outcomes. And the centerpiece of that planning effort has been the planning for performance tool, which is uh, it's a tool that, that is essentially allows MassDOT to begin to project uh, the future performance of, of some key asset categories, things like uh, bridge condition or, or pavement rating, uh, the age of public transportation rolling stock, and uh, to allow us to, uh, and, and to see the performance of those assets at, at various potential future levels of, of funding. And it really helps MassDOT understand what the trade-offs are um, in terms of our, our funding allocations, what the trade-offs are between various assets or even across modes between highway and transit. And it's really going to be uh, a really key um, tool for us to use in moving us towards a more performance-based, uh, uh, performance-driven capital budgeting process. If you go to the next slide, Dana, this just shows the... Uh, this shows you sort of the, the flow chart and how we move fits in currently to the to the capital process. Basically, uh, you know, we, we got started uh, with the CIP by identifying the available level of funding and um, and coming up with a preliminary set of investment uh, priorities. We then could use the We Move Massachusetts uh, tool to understand what the performance outcomes uh, you know were going to be of those decisions and. Using that analysis, as well as all of the input we've gotten through these six public hearings we've held, uh, in addition to letters and emails that have been submitted in, will help us get to that final CIP. Uh, the expectation is, is that we go through future iterations of the CIP process. The We Move tool is going to continue to evolve. We'll, we'll probably be able to add additional asset categories to the ones we used in the initial uh, rollout of the tool. Well, we hope to have access to better data and information uh, to, to input into the model and ultimately get to a point where the we move tool can be uh, you know a, an important part of setting initial CIP priorities right from sort of the outset of the process so that's kind of where we that's kind of where we are the the report is on our um, mass.dot website on the we move there's a we move page there and uh, we we invite your comments tonight or you could submit them uh, by writing by the end of this week by the 14th So uh, this, uh, we're coming to the end of our part of the presentation, uh, but just to make sure you know, uh, the CIPs, as Scott said, are online. Uh, we're glad to get you this information specifically. Uh, we don't have any physical copies. They are rather thick books, but uh, if you give us your name and address, we'll uh, get one to you as quickly as we can. Uh, this, as you see, is the last of the public hearings. There's one going on at UMass Dartmouth uh, this evening as well. We want your comments. There are comment cards that are available to fill out this evening. Uh, there's the website. We'll be taking notes as you speak. Um, uh, I would uh, adjust the date uh, instead of February 14th uh, to, frankly, tomorrow, uh, February 11th, because uh, it was determined a couple of weeks ago that uh, the board needs to vote on this, and the board meeting uh, for this month is on Wednesday. So uh, don't wait until after Wednesday to get us your comments. Please get us your comments uh, today, tomorrow, uh, and not later than that, if you don't mind, because we do need to take those comments. We need to try and adjust the plan for the comments that we think are, uh, are, 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 are very constructive, and we've seen some very constructive uh, comments, and we have adjusted the plan uh, during the past couple of weeks as the hearings have taken place. So with that, and I'll ask you to limit your time to three minutes, um, we're going to start with the uh, public comment, and uh, I would call number one. Hey, Dana, could, could we get number one to five to line up so that we can keep people in order as we go? Sure. Okay, thank you very much, Donnie. 
Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for holding this, uh, this meeting. It's been very informative. <clears throat> My name is David Knowlton. I'm the city engineer in Salem, and I'm also the current president of the Massachusetts Highway Association. We are a group that's made up of DPW directors, city town engineers, and highway superintendents from across the Commonwealth. And um, we um, <clears throat> get together to try and uh, promote our causes. And, and uh, you know, we're the, we're the folks that use the Chapter 90 money. Um, we know how to use it uh, effectively. And uh, I'd like to lobby you this evening to uh, increase the amount of money that you're planning to, to provide to us. Um, just to let you know, the uh, Mass Highway is a statewide uh, group, um, but it's comprised of um, county organizations as well. And the uh, folks that are going to speak after me uh, represent the Essex County uh, Highway Organization. So we're the folks that use the money. Um, we would like to see the number at 300 million rather than the 200 million that you're proposing. Uh, we have um, documented the need for that. Uh, back in 2012, the Massachusetts Municipal Association helped us with a survey. Um, we contacted over 20, 229 communities across the Commonwealth and came up with a, an annual need of $562 million every year. Okay, we know that that's not um, reasonable to expect to see that kind of money, but uh, we think that $300 million is, is a reasonable amount. I have copies of the, um, the survey results that I can leave with you, so you'll have that. You can take a look at those. Um, <clears throat> we need to spend um, more money than just $200 million a year. We need to spend that $300 million so that we can avoid reconstructing roads at this point in time. We need to start doing more preservation, more, more cost-effective uh, things to our local roadways that will avoid uh, and, and extend the useful life of the roadway so we're not doing as much reconstruction, the, the um, things that cost a lot more money uh, in the future. We commend you for the uh, five-year plan. We'd certainly love to see a 10-year plan. Um, it's all in the planning. You know, if we know that we're gonna get a consistent amount of money every year, if, it, if it's a, a five or 10-year plan, we can make decisions that um, will allow us to use the money uh, smarter and, and more effectively. We can also respond to our uh, residents in, in our, our communities and let them know what the plan is. Um, if we don't have a, 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 a consistent plan over a number of years. We just don't know how much money we're going to have available. We can't answer questions that, that, that come up with that. So that helps out uh, as well. Um, and finally, <coughs> excuse me, finally, um, we'd like to see the 300 million tied uh, index to inflation so that we can be assured, you know, if 300 million is the number now that we're comfortable with, that we know what the need is, we can be assured in the future that that same value is going to be, be there. You know, our chapter 90 money really hasn't gone up uh, significantly, there's been some jumps here and there, but over the past 20 years, cost of doing construction has gone up considerably. Cost for materials has gone up, equipment, labor, everything, and there really hasn't been a, a, an adjustment for inflation for that. So we'd like to see that as the third component, um, the, the Chapter 90 program indexed to, uh, to some type of inflation. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nolden. Number two. Good evening. Um, I'm J.T. Gosher, DPW Commissioner for the City of Lynn, and I'm here to speak as a public works official uh, for the last 24 years. And uh, the use of Chapter 90 funds is some of the only funds that communities have to do road work and maintain their roads. Uh, very few fund their own projects. Um, and the contracts can't be executed unless we have Chapter 90 funds in place. And once we get the word, if the word comes late, contracts get let out late, and that causes its own set of problems. But just even before you can start a contract, you have to do notifications of utilities. That utility work has to be done beforehand. Uh, wetlands filings, and they're time sensitive. If you don't get a project done in time, you gotta refile. Um, Prequalifications of your contractors, your bidding process, and then you bid award, and the contractor goes out and does his bonding, insurance, and certificates, and whatnot. And that costs a lot of money just to get to that point. Now, when the contract is held up, you don't get the work done, or it slides that it's too late uh, in the season to get the work done effectively, you have to postpone a project for a year, and it doesn't get done. Um, I've had to postpone several projects over the years. I've even had to hold off on doing Chapter 90 work just so I could let it build up for the next season and start fresh in the spring. Um, with everyone trying to get work done at the end of the year, 
you can't schedule your contractors in to get it done because they're all they're stretched too thin. Uh, and with that, that causes uh, reduction in your quality control as far as the pavement, paving in the colder weather. Uh, then you have a safety issue there. You can't get the striping down in cold weather after it's paved. So what we're asking is the funds to be released early, the earlier the better, March, April, we can get things rolling at that time because uh, then we can be for sure that we're going to have what we planned be able to put into place and move forward with all the pre-work that I just mentioned earlier. And we certainly would like the $300 million that the House authorized. Thank you very much. Thank you. Number three, please. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Lisa DeMeo. I'm the city, <coughs> excuse me, the city engineer in Lowell. I'm also a member of the uh, board of directors of Essex County Highway. Uh, with, like my fellow municipal employees, uh, um, also asking for $300 million in Chapter 90. Uh, I'm pleased to see that it's being proposed that it'll be the same number every year, that will be one less unknown that we have to deal with. Lowell has got a population of 106,000 people. It's the fourth largest city in the state based on population. We have 275 centerline miles in 14.5 square miles. It's very densely populated. Our roads get a lot of use. With the Chapter 90 money that we've been getting, we've used it very efficiently and very economically. We've embraced the complete streets policies. So we're providing alternative routes, uh, alternative methods of transportation so that some of those highly densely used streets will be lessened a little bit. Uh, we include bike lanes, ADA compliant sidewalks. In the future, we're probably going to have a trolley system in, in Lowell that's being planned right now. And all, all of these concepts and philosophies are similar to your own healthy transportation compact and the Bay State Greenway. So we're following the same policies that, that you are using it yourself. We're also developing and expanding our own bike network in conjunction with UMass Lowell so we can get the students and the university themselves put a lot of cars on the streets. Our streets get a lot of use. We do crack sealing and we do pavement management, all with our Chapter 90 funds. So it's a very economical use of all of the funding that you do give us. The last pavement management report that we got recommended that we, sp we should be spending $4 million a year just to maintain the average PCI at 70. And if so, the Chapter 9, we usually get 1.8 million in that ballpark for the last few years. That's less than half of what the pavement management report recommended. If we continue just with that number, the average PCI is going to be dropping to 63 in just four years because of the heavy, heavy use that we have on our roads. Now, the city does have some skin in the game. The last two years, the city council has voted to contribute some of the city money to the, to the paving plan that we use. So in addition to the Chapter 90, I do have some city money. But it, it's, it's not a lot. I'm grateful for it, but it's not a lot. So the, the, um, get, uh, the delay, they mentioned the delays in getting the Chapter 90 funding. And that pushes everything back in the calendar with all of the issues that uh, my colleague just mentioned. But every time that the asphalt prices go up within the, that time frame of the, count, of the contract, the number of miles we can pave goes down. So it means the value to the program is going down for us. As much as we appreciate it, if the value is going down, it's also going down for the administration as well. The bargaining value of the Chapter 90 program is going down if the value to us is going down. So all what I'm trying to say here is that my municipal colleagues and I are good stewards of the funds that you do give us. The request to add another $100 million to this to this project is in all sincerity. We will, we will put this money to good use and when we desperately need it. Thank you. Number four. Good evening. I'm uh, Bruce Thibodeau. I'm the DPW director for the town of North Andover and also vice president of Essex County Highway Association. Uh, I couldn't echo more my colleagues uh, tonight. Um, I think they, they put it very well. I think you're seeing a theme here that we, we definitely believe that if we get the 300 million uh, that we can plan and um, develop sustainable projects. More importantly, we need to be, have some predictability in this, in this program. Uh, last year, I too get 
some local funds um, to, to put into the projects. But I had to cut my program short in, at the end of August because we were trying to push too, many, too much funds through a small, too small a pipe. Uh, we couldn't get the contractors programmed and in, in, in up to speed. I got some in the early part of the year, but I couldn't get them later on. So we, we end up having to push a lot of projects off. And, um, and, my, and I hear the same thing from everybody on, that are in, that's a member of my association, uh, that we really need that predictability uh, and consistency in the program. And I hope that, that you will um, have the Chapter 90 be uh, predicted every year in, in, in the bond issue. Again, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chivita. Uh, number five. Hi, my name is uh, Bob Langley. I'm the Director of Public Services in Peabody. And uh, I'm here along with my colleagues from Essex County Highway and Mass Highway uh, to ask you for the $300 million, um, if possible. Uh, currently, um, the funds that we receive for the Chapter 90 program are vital for our community to pave our roads and to maintain some of the infrastructure that we have. The 300 million over a multi-year program would enable us to be able to put more money into this uh, vital program. Currently, uh, Peabody receives in the neighborhood of $1.2 million a year, and just our backlog of work alone is in the 25 to $30 million a year. So as you can see, each year we're putting in some capital and we're just getting farther behind. Um, we have a community of over 50,000 people. We have over 170 lane miles of road, and um, we do utilize many of the programs that you're talking about here tonight. We're actually doing an accelerated bridge program on one of our bridges, and we really appreciate that support from the state. Much of what you've outlined tonight in the plan is, is um, extremely positive for the future in that it's transparent and we can see what's going on and we can see where you're, you're trying to put the money uh, for a vital in infrastructure. One of the things that we really like to see is releasing uh, Chapter 90 funds April 1st, um, early in the year. I want to reiterate what my colleague said. It's very difficult to plan and do work if you don't know when the money's going to come. And everybody ends up getting the money later in the year, and then everybody's using the same contractors and resources to try to get the job done. Um, with that, I'd just like to reiterate, we would like uh, to, to have this money in the future, and we appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Number six. Thank you. Uh, Tom Philbin from the uh, Massachusetts Municipal Association. Uh, the MMA represents uh, 300, well, 350, 351 uh, cities and towns, depending on if everybody's paid their dues. Um, but I just want to, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having this meeting and thank the governor and uh, Secretary Davey uh, and uh, members of the uh, legislature for uh, raising this issue. Uh, um, it's been an uh, incredibly difficult battle over the past year or so. The last time the gas tax was raised um, was 22 years ago. Uh, and that's, that's unbelievable because this whole time the costs have been going up for maintaining our roads. Um, Secretary Davey had uh, said in many meetings, you know, we're doing outreach, this is what the people want. They want to invest in, in uh, infrastructure and roads and bridges. Um, in fact, 60% uh, when they did a poll uh, on whether folks would support the gas tax, 60% said yes, as long as we know where the money's going, as long as it's going to roads. Um, that was a big thing. Um, in fact, your own stakeholders' uh, 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 interviews and, and uh, questions were out there, and the answer overwhelmingly, um, along with maintaining transit, was maintaining local roads. So um, that's what we want to do. Um, in fact, you mentioned a state of good repair, and that's where 80% of the money is going. When it goes to um, Chapter 90, which is basically pavement management, what this does, and crack ceiling and some other things, it's repaving roads. What this allows is for those roads to last much longer uh, than they would. In fact, if a state is in, uh, kept in a state, if a road is kept in a state of good repair, every dollar invested to keep it properly maintained 
will save six to ten dollars in avoided repair costs that become necessary to rebuild the road when it fails due to lack of maintenance. That's an investment. That's saving money in the long run. So I have to say, um, these guys, Mass Highway Association, members of the municipal officials throughout the uh, state, lobbied hard, um, educated residents, went to ed board meetings, went to public hearings and testified and told residents and convinced them uh, that it's important to invest in, in, in this gas tax and the three cent increase, and then some if possible. But it's short-sighted to level fund Chapter 90 at $200 million. We already know that it's gonna save you six to $10 down the road for every dollar invested. We're just trying to maintain the roads. If you go out on the roads today and look around, potholes are everywhere right now and it costs a lot of money to fix them. We need to maintain those. Now, I wanna end real quick. The gas tax was part of the solution. But there's also a ballot question right now. The gas tax was also indexed to inflation. That's incredibly important. Like I said before, it took 22 years in a crisis at the MBTA, in a crisis with our local roads, in a crisis with our bridges, to raise it three cents. 22 years. What will happen now, if it's not indexed to inflation, it could take another 22 years and we'll wind up back here again. So the fact that People who polled, 60% said, we agree with that as long as we know where the money is going and, and, and assuming it's going to local roads. To have none of that gas tax revenue right now, level funded, go to uh, increase in Chapter 90 is not uh, penny wise and pound foolish, I should say. It's got to be invested. It was a commitment out there. It was $300 million. It was a pro proposed $300 million over 10 years in your last capital plan. The next one comes up, it's 200 million level funded for the next five years. So it needs to increase even incrementally, um, but we need to do that to maintain our local roads and keep the commitment of the Commonwealth to local cities and towns. After all, the gas tax was invented and uh, um, created in 1973 to help local communities fund their projects. We need to continue that and we need to continue our partnership with the state because we can't be fixing our roads with property taxes limited by two and a half and other pressures put on municipalities. We need that gas tax to go to our local roads and not just the mass, uh, mass state highways and the public uh, transit and everywhere else. It's gotta go to local roads. It's the most efficient money spent. So thank you very much. Sorry to take up your time. Thank you, Mr. Philbin. Uh, I, I think it's, you bring up one, uh, uh, several good points, but one in particular that I'd like to underscore, and that's the fact that the indexing uh, is going to be a ballot question, as we understand, uh, in November. Um, if the indexing is repealed, uh, the capacity for funding uh, is not in the tens of millions of dollars, it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars that will be curtailed if that indexing is not, uh, uh, does not remain as the plan calls for it uh, to be done now. Thank you. Number seven through 10, please. Good evening, everybody. I wanna first off, uh, first off, uh, first off, my name is Jack Selswack and I'm a Lynn resident. I wanna thank you all for coming tonight. I want to commend you guys as well as Secretary Davey, the well, Governor Patrick, for all their support to try to come up with a comprehensive transportation plan to try to move the state forward and under very tough times financially, but it's a good plan to try to start something. So, uh, just a little background on what, why I've always been interest, interested in transportation and planning. Um, I co-founded a page on Facebook recently uh, titled Blue Line, Bring the Blue Line to Win. Uh, me and Self Album just out of a whim almost uh, started a page a couple months ago. We already have more, almost 2,000 likes on Facebook just on the idea of getting the blue line to win. Now, I think it, that's one of the most important projects if we can get the funding. Obviously, that's the billion dollar question to get the funding, but I think the blue line to win would be the most important project you can do for the North Shore because it would move more people in and out of the North Shore into Boston and the airport than almost any other project. It would, move more project, it would move more people in a single day. It would move more people than the South, Shore, uh, South Coast Rail Line would in the entire day. It's that important. 
So I think there's a clear demand for land to have it. Now, I did notice in the uh, move Massachusetts plan, move forward plan, of having uh, an indigo line enhanced rail service to come to Lynn, perhaps with a few different quarters. And as an interim process, I would agree with that plan. I think that could be a good step because that would give us enhanced service to Lynn and some of these other quarters like Alston and connecting the waterfront to downtown Boston to uh, everywhere in Alston. So I think that's a great idea. Of course, if you were to do that, I think you should also improve downtown Lynn's train station. It's a nice station, but it's already 20 years old, and I think it's time for it to be fixed up. And if you do have that enhanced indigo line service, I think another station that needs to be enhanced would be Chelsea. Because if people are taking the train from Lynn or Salem or Rockport, and they want to go to the airport, say we don't have the rule line, they would want to get off to Chelsea. Now, I know one of the parts of the plan is to build the uh, silver line to extend it to Chelsea Station. Well, if you make a nice new intermodal station where you can take a train right to the silver line, that's not the blue line, but it's a nice step in between. But uh, I want to iter reiterate, the blue line was such an important project for the city of Lynn to move forward. If we have any casinos down the line, the airport to connect to North Shore will be very important. A uh, couple other things I want to mention. Statewide transportation planning is great because it can work the entire state. And if you can get the uh, enhanced bill service to go along the uh, Boston to Springfield corridor, I know there's been some talk about that. How I recommend it because I think it's a shame. If you live in Worcester, you can't take a train to New York or Hartford. The only options are roads or the bus. There used to be a train that ran every day from Boston to Hartford. Didn't, doesn't exist anymore, so I highly recommend that you do that. Enhance South Station, that would be great. You do all that, why don't we build a self, uh, North South Rail Link? That would be a very lot of money, but I think it would be a great plan. So those are some ideas I hope you guys consider, and thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Number eight, please. Good evening. My name is Seth Albaum. I'm a downtown Lynn resident, president of the Downtown Lynn Neighborhood Association, editor of lynnhappens.com, and co-conspirator with Jack Suslack on the Bring the Blue Line to Lynn Facebook page. And uh, I, I just, I have to second everything Jack said because it makes sense. Whether the money is there now or not, I think it's important that we start laying the groundwork so that we don't kick the can down the road you know, every generation. 50, 60 years ago, I think there was talk of bringing the blue line here. There was talk of bringing the blue line here as big dig mit uh, mitigation, for example. I have a few notes, so bear with me. I'll still be brief. So we're a city of over 90,000 people that needs better ways to get in and out. We have limited space for road improvements, so we need to look to mass transit. Now I'd like to say, leave it to the experts, they'll figure out the best way to get mass transit here, but I'm not convinced the Indigo line is an adequate solution. Um, the Indigo line isn't quite the blue line. Also, we live in area four. We pay tolls in area six. And what benefit do we receive from that? Downtown Lynn is a transit-oriented community that lacks adequate transit. Unless you're a nine to five employee in downtown Boston, or you can, I mean, there are some people can, I almost forgot the buses, but uh, yeah, I mean, I hear complaints about the buses too. It's, uh, we're a growing community. Uh, we have new apartments that are gonna come online at the corner of Broad and Silsby Streets. We have a project proposed for Market Street. We have a huge project uh, proposed um, on Washington Street and Lower Washington Street here. And those residents are going to need increased levels of service and uh, I'm sorry my neighbors are not here. They're still on their way home from work. They're on the train, they're on the clogged roads right now. Uh, and as the community grows, our, ne our needs are not being served. Uh, 91,000 is a lot of people. 
And the entire region, not just Lynn, will benefit from the improved service and easier access in and out. Uh, I, I can only see, uh, see it being good for the entire regional economy. Thank you. Thank you. Number nine. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Fred Moore. I used to represent the town of Saugus on the T Advisory Board, along with other citizen advocate uh, positions. Um, my first suggestion to you people at MassDOT is maybe you ought to get yourself a laser pointer so you can point at your pie chart there and everything. But I'd like to say I made a public comment many years ago about we had a lot of redundant overlapping bureaucracies concerning transportation around here. It'd be nice if they could merge them all into one agency. Congratulations on getting there. You know, some things do go right and some things don't. I got this very ambiguous numeral that I underlined as a six and evidently I became nine at the convenience of the highway lobby where municipality after municipality says, where's my free money for roads? We want more free money for roads. And they do that all the time. And so what I gotta say is, you know, the highway lobby is a gluttonous beast with an insatiable appetite. And we've seen scant expansion of transit railways since I-95 was canceled in 1973. We thought things were gonna be different. We've been waiting a half a century for something to happen. We haven't gotten nothing from the central artery mitigations or anything. You showed us a pie chart up there with the pathetic little sliver for the blue line and the program for mass transportation has become a perverted maintenance travesty. It's not become a vision for expansion of the system anymore. It's become, well, we've got to repair the deferred maintenance now, so forget about expansion. That's what they're telling us. And so our area is going to continue to go into economic dereliction and decline based on this. The Patrick administration has done us a great disservice for dropping us, not only telling us to take the bus, but throwing us under it uh, with the South Coast Rail Line. It's going to cost more, move less people, have a negligible influence on transit-oriented land use patterns. It's essentially going to be satellite parking for the benefit of downtown Boston. And it's all about the bean counting exercise of how many cars are not going to be on the expressway with that one, instead of the affecting the land use synergy that happens with transportation development, which is the North Shore is different. The people talk about their chapter 90 money and how they want it for their roads and how they use it very well. I can believe them having had the three ring binder with a municipal budget and being in that position. But what I see here is you've got this ped and bike uh, accommodation here, 100 million. Give them that and why don't you let them decide what they're gonna do with it. Because I've seen these, I'm a big bike rider. I ride my bike every day to work at the Riverworks. And I'll tell you that uh, this destruction of our transit corridor, potential transit corridor put, to put this bike to the slum sea project in here is useless to me as a cyclist for transportation. It was not a transportation facility. It seems to be more like a linear park, a recreation facility. And unless you do snow removal and have lighting on it at night, it is not transportation. Don't try to call it that, because it isn't. So why don't you take that 100 million you got for bike ped facilities and just roll it into your chapter 90 budget and let the municipalities decide how they're gonna divvy it up. Uh, another one I'd like to tell you is, you have your means testing out here. We're gonna have a metric to make the decisions on how we're going to spend this money. Uh, let me tell you something. There was a road called the Newburyport Turnpike. You might be familiar with it. The Mass Highway Department issued a report in 1907 when they were starting to build highways. And their vision of this mostly abandoned dirt road was, it'll be too expensive and hardly anybody will use it. So we don't recommend making it a state highway. So don't believe everything you read in studies. A lot of these are bag jobs from the get-go. And the credibility of your agencies is eroded by this kind of mentality. 
Uh, one of the other things I'd like to touch upon is, is that you need to enforce the mitigation of the central artery, the big dig mitigations. You remember the big MOU that caused the green line to be built? I'm saying, where is it? The green line is technically not nearly as difficult as doing the big dig, and yet the big dig is already becoming obsolete and already go jammed up, and the green line, you've yet to even break ground on that. We see a blatant favoritism in the capital spending to the south of Boston suburbs. Do you notice that every inch of the old colony rail system got put in before everybody, they jumped to the front of the queue, and now we're sitting there saying, ah, oh, well, you, we only have a few table scraps left to capital fund you on the north side. Uh, we think that there's a favoritism in the political circles, and now the South Coast Rail line has jumped to the queue in front of us. And Sir, I'm going to ask you to uh, uh, start wrapping it up. Uh, you have a minute left, if you don't mind. Okay, so what I'm just going to say is that we need more transit railway expansion on the north side. We don't need more and wider highways. And we certainly don't want a saga sandwich where you widen all the roads at 120, north of 128 and you widen the lower north shore things in Revere, right? And you do that project where you add the lane on Route 1. Uh, I believe that that's a violation of the memorandum of understanding because it's capacity expansion to a radial highway inside of 128. And according to the MIU, that's not supposed to happen. So don't let it happen. And don't try to palm off recreational bike trails out of purloined transit corridors as transportation, because they're not. And let me just say, I look at the trucks parked in the General Electric parking lot every day, and the size of the vehicles used as commuter vehicles in there tell me that gas taxes aren't nearly high enough. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, number 10, please. Good evening. My name is Robin Rivera from Marblehead, Massachusetts. I'm the Transportation Specialist for the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters of Massachusetts would like to see the citizens of the Commonwealth provided with reliable, enjoyable, and environmentally sound public transit options. We would also like our public transportation system running safely and vibrantly. A tipping point where Massachusetts residents prefer public transit to their own vehicles is ideal for road maintenance, pollution, control, and safety. For this tipping point to happen, how our transit system is financed and maintained is of utmost importance. In examining MassDOT's capital investment plan, we are happy to see the five-year plan addressing transit needs statewide, but it is clear we are doing a lot with a little bit of money. It is also clear in instances of replacing MBTA buses, we are doing nothing at all. We are deeply disappointed that the CIP fails to invest in replacing MBTA buses. With $450 million in bus overhauls presently needed, Failure to invest in these needs will cause delays, congestion, safety issues, and increased pollution. Buses are an important part of the MBTA, servicing some of our lowest income residents who rely on them for commuting. We would like to take this opportunity to highlight the active streets provisions provided by Transportation for Mass and our current Transportation Bond Bill. We support legislature that will build the active, vibrant, and safe communities and hope to see this passed. It's also important to note that riders who will be facing a fare increase should also be provided with reliable transportation options. Lastly, for the state's transportation system to remain vibrant and healthy, it is of utmost importance that financing for transportation be seen as a top priority from our legislatures. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robert. Uh, would 11 through 14 please line up? Is number 11 available? Number 12? Oh. My name is Rick Vitoski. I'm here as a transit advocate. And as a federal employee, this uh, agency is also facing um, congressional mandates on uh, measurable outcomes and performance standards like I feel for you guys <laughs> so but what I'd like to focus on today is is really the mass the we move mass publication in which you state there's a couple of focuses uh, the two focuses I'd like to comment on 
are what you call meeting customer service goals and needs, and also establishing a culture of innovation and accountability at the state transportation level, which um, is sorely lacking, and I'd like to make a few suggestions and point out a few facts. <clears throat> First of all, in reading your, your publications, I didn't understand how simple consumer customer needs get met. And I need, think you need to make very clear in your final publications how an individual consumer can get, where does he go to? And I'll give you an example. I ride the train in here from Lynn every day into downtown Boston. Um, this winter has been brutal. There's no protection from the wind on the platform. Years ago, and several times I've written to the T to ask them to put maybe one of their old bus shelters. If you look at the Sullivan Square Station, they have those old orange bus shelters on the subway platform. It's a nice wind protection. As we ride by it in the train, you look at the yard on the um, Mystic River there, there must be about 100 of them just stacked up there, probably ready to be thrown out. All you need to do, this is a simple thing. It should be a simple process. If you're going to say that you're going to be customer-oriented, how does a customer get a simple request like that done? I'm not asking for $100 million in Chapter 90 money. I'm just asking for take a shelter that's sitting in your yard and put it on the platform for wind protection for your riders. That's a simple thing. You guys are all thinking big here, but also think simple and small. But in addition to that, there's some other way, things that can be done. You're talking about revenue. Everybody's screaming, revenue, the feds are squeezing us, the state gas tax isn't enough, blah, blah, blah. You say in your publication that you're going to focus on innovation and accountability. Where is it? How are you going to do that? And I'll give you some examples. I'm a very big transit advocate, so I read a lot of things. There's a transit system called Caltrain in California that runs between San Jose and San Francisco. Happens to be the exact same distance between <coughs> Framingham or Worcester and Boston. Ten years ago, they started a new service called the Baby Bullet Service, which uses the exact same engines that you're now having delivered here, the exact same rail cards, the tracks are built to the same Federal Railway Administration's Class 4 standard of up to 80 miles an hour, which you never run the trains at except on maybe your new constructions, you're talking about doing that on the new Fitchburg line, and you're doing that, talking about doing it on the Haverhill line, at least for the Downeaster, when the tracks are re rehabbed, a double track. But you don't seem to be thinking about that on Worcester. Okay? It's a common sense way. And let me tell you what happened when, Matt, when Caltrain did that. The revenue went up in the last 10 years, ridership, I'm sorry, the ridership went up 175% in the last 10 years after they put the baby bullet service in. Now, we have someone from the planning department. I'm going to ask him, try and get a trip out there and ride the system and see what it does so that you can plan it here. Okay, not only did their ridership go up 170%, their fare box recovery rate went up 22%. First of all, the ridership on the boston Framingham line hasn't changed at all in, 20, in the last 10 years, and our fare box recovery hasn't gone up much at all. Okay. Now, that's, that's just simple replication of an existing service that's out there. You don't have to do thousands of studies and all kinds of things. Just go out there and look at their service and see what can be replicated here. Now, there's other things that can be done, too. Um, and I'm just going to go through a couple of them. Please hold with me. So one is the speed. Let's talk about right now. You've got two garages under construction. There's no parking at the Salem station. You've got a garage sitting four blocks from here with 1,000 spaces in it that's never even filled more than like 300 at the most. And that's when people are parking their cars in there because they want them off the street for snow plowing. Okay. There's no connection between getting the passengers from Salem to park here and use the train section from train from here. And one of the main reasons is the Salem Express doesn't stop in Lynn. Now, one of the reasons it doesn't stop at Lynn is everybody wants to get into the, the slots that are in North Station. But there's a fact out here that seems just so absurd to me that in 1996, there was a crash in Chelsea 
where a bike car hit an oil tanker that was stuck on the tracks. The oil tank, tr tank truck was stuck on the tracks because as it was crossing it, it was a rough crosser, its airline brake line, its air brake line broke, this thing stopped on the track and was jammed there. Along comes a bud car at 60 miles an hour, which was the track speed at that time, crashes into this gasoline truck. Nobody got killed from the crash. Everyone died from suffocation because a fire started and the door in the car opened inward and they had all piled against the door and there were lights there. So the uh, Department of Public Utilities put a speed restriction of 35 miles an hour on the trains going through Chelsea. That was a 1996 temporary speed restriction, okay? Temporary, until the crossings were, were fixed, regraded, new equipment was in, that's why all the trains now have sliding doors rather than the ones that open. They all have windows that can bust out, they all have tools in them and so forth. Now, I've written to the team a number of times asking them to go to the PUC and get that speed restriction lifted. If you got that speed lifted, you could have the express trains from Beverly and Salem stop in the Lynn Station and still get to the North Station in the same time frame that they do now. So this is simple management and accountability issues that have to be addressed. You have to find a mechanism for how does this stuff get addressed in your planning. I mean, how does someone like me that can see this make a suggestion to someone that will listen to it and think, this is common sense, why can't we do it? Okay. Now, of course, the big banana in the room and the best way that you could answer your finance needs is to simply replicate what MTR did in Hong Kong when it was under British rule, not the Chinese. This was done under the British. MTR is Mass Transit Rail Corporation Limited. It runs all the transit in Hong Kong. It runs all the commuter rail in London. It runs the commuter rail in a number of Melbourne, Australia, and other, other agencies. <coughs> Which, by the way, it didn't <coughs> respond at all to the RFP for a new operator for <coughs> commuter rail which to me, I just don't understand, but they are in the business of operating other systems. But here's what they did to get funding in Hong Kong, and there's no reason why it can't be done in the United States and in Boston, is the company was an agency just like the MBTA, a public agency. It turned itself into a for-profit corporation. What it did is it sold only 24% of its stock the rest of the stock was held by the government of uh, Hong Kong, which could be the state of Massachusetts. They did an IPO for this 24% of the stock. They took that money from the, from the IPO. They used it to, in Hong Kong, all the land has to be leased from the government. It's not sold. So they leased land next to stations. And then they got into partnerships with developers, and they built on that land and on the air rights over the stations. And to this day, right now, they do not get one penny in, substitute, in subsidy from the Hong Kong government. Because when they, build the, 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 when they had development done on their tracks and the adjoining station land, they ground leased it where they get a percentage, just like Massport does. This is, this is not brain science. Massport does this. All that land around your interchange that was built uh, at the seaport the Fidelity Ho the Seaport Hotel, the parking garage, they get a percentage of the gross rent as income. You could do the same thing with the T. Think of the T at Assembly Square. You spend $25 million building a station and you don't get any benefit from the land development next to it. What they did in Hong Kong, they've done it so they get all the benefit from it. And it supports it so that the government of Hong Kong now doesn't give them a penny of subsidy a year. In fact, since they own 76% of the stock and it's a public li listed stock, they get dividend income of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. Sir, I'm going to ask you to start to wrap it up, please. Okay. I just have one question on these comments that are due tomorrow. Is that on, this, uh, on the capital improvement plan or yes. on the We Move Massachusetts plan? It's on both. It's on both. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and how does it, can I get the address of where they send it? Uh, yes. Uh, we, we'll bring up the computer. It's up there. Uh, and if it's a common car that you're writing now, 
you can give it to one of the people no, from I'm our send staff. It in by email. Okay, uh, we'll have that up there in a moment, uh, so you'll see that there. Thank you. Uh, number twelve, please. Number twelve. I'm sorry, you twelve. Number thirteen. The last one, number fourteen. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So uh, my name is Ed Marshall, I'm a Peabody resident, and I guess we're going to end on rail. Um, I would have given him in a couple more minutes, because I agree with that. The uh, reason I came tonight was I attended a similar hearing back in 2003 at the Peabody Institute Library in Danvers, and it was a 10-year plan that was put up there, and one of the items on there was the uh, parking garage over in Salem, so hey, planning worked. <clears throat> uh, the other thing that really caught my eye at that hearing was a plan or a proposal at the time to start doing spurs uh, off of the Salem line into Peabody Square, out through uh, Wilson Square, up into Danvers, and doing more park and ride. And as a lot of folks have said around, uh, you know, the highway folks got their word here early, and uh, a lot of us who really believe in the value of rail, I went to school in Boston, worked in Boston a number of years, have always refuse to drive into Boston because the roads are horrible. Um, I don't see more lanes doing anything except attracting more cars, and as gasoline prices consistently edge closer to $4 and that's not going away, the T ridership is only going to go up. And I agree that we have a need, a capital need for more rolling stock, but I also think that uh, the decisions we make now in planning uh, are going to affect uh, land use, residency patterns for decades to come. We saw this with highways and the development of suburbs. There's no reason that shouldn't be taking place once again with uh, rail stock. Uh, we are fortunate in the Northeast because we are so densely settled. It makes no sense to try to plow more and more highways like we tried to do with 95 into Lynn into densely settled areas. It makes much more sense to try to uh, reestablish some of these rail lines. I happen to like bike paths only because they do preserve the rights of ways because we will need them once again. And so I would encourage, I didn't see the 2003 proposal to push out park and rides out to the North Shore Mall and up off of 128 in Danvers, which I thought was a good idea at the time to try to get more cars off of those overburdened highways, which are still parking lots at rush hour. Uh, I didn't see those in the current plans and I would encourage people to take a look at those again because those rail lines are still sitting there and uh, could potentially be, uh, again, connected to Salem. Uh, it's great to have a garage over there, but you're just gonna make a bigger traffic jam in downtown Salem as more people dive in there and try to use it. So to try to get people out you know, of their cars closer to where they live and onto the rails makes a lot of sense to me. And I'd just like to endorse his plan for the Hong Kong funding, because that sounds like a winner. Thank you very much. Um, people who were not, uh, who didn't have cards, uh, if you'd like to speak, you're more than welcome to. Uh, you have your hand up. Now there's got to be at least 20 of us around here with wheelchairs. 
people are getting older and unfortunately handicapped, not walking goes with it. You get wheelchairs, you're going to be there in a couple of years right along with me. You people are only a couple of years behind me. <laughs> and I've watched, okay, I've watched people, I've watched my own brother going, oh, what are you doing? And uh, you better close your mouth because a couple of years later, they got their walker and they got their cane and they got their other stuff. People have worked hard, free of charge, taken the old runway, uh, old runways, old train rigs, beautiful, beautiful walkways, but they got to include the wheelchair. They're just not thinking it one step away. And building it now without it, 10 years down the road, they're going to be no good to probably half or at least the third of the population. Okay? Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Anybody else like to uh, speak? Yes, sir. <laughs> Could you speak louder, please? So I'm Brian Shaw. I'm a resident, no particular affiliation. Um, a couple things came up when I was thinking about um, various transit issues. One is, um, where's, is there going to be any funding for preliminary studies on the Indigo line? Um, that's very exciting, but if we don't have funding to at least pay the consultants to take a look and see what's going to be required for it, it's probably not going to happen by 2024 as everyone would like. Which brings me to another item, uh, and that is just the availability of information to the public. Um, sometimes it feels like I have to chase urban planners to figure out when these meetings are. And while it's great that there's a Bring the Blue Line to Lynn Facebook page that can tell me these things, and a friend of mine happens to be a civil engineering student, I shouldn't have to do that. Um, it would be really, really, really helpful to have um, links to the latest publicly available documents, whether it's in a public comment period or a finally approved document available from websites, whether it be MassDOT or um, a regional planning commission, and heck, even knowing where to find the name of the regional planning commission would be very helpful, um, especially for younger folks like me who tend to be um, increasingly interested in transit, increasingly adept with things like the internet, and um, increasingly interested in having fewer cars and more trains. Um, another thing that comes to mind is just there are a lot of job centers that are really not on public transit and weren't built to be on public transit, specifically around 128. Um, I can think of maybe a most of examples of a job center in the city of Woburn. Burlington's also guilty of a lot of this. Um, there's a lot of jobs that are just very hard to get to by public transit by, because they're simply not in Boston. The, all the transit goes into Boston with maybe a few exceptions. And I would like to see a few proposals for just, I know it takes time to build up ridership along a route and I know these aren't the most densely populated routes, but perhaps a study to see if it's viable to bring a bus service between Lynn or Salem to, say, Woburn or Burlington. And that's just one example on the North Shore area and north of Boston. I'm sure you can find many more in the south, southern part and out west. That would be just at least say we have done a study and it's worth doing or it's not worth doing. And if it's not worth doing, then so be it. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anybody else like to uh, comment? If not, I believe we have reached the end of the presentation. Uh, a number of us will be sticking around for a while. We have the room until 8 o'clock. If you want to talk to us uh, about some specific subjects, we're glad to engage you in that conversation. I want to thank my MassDOT colleagues and my T MBTA colleagues for uh, joining me here this evening. And we all want to thank you for uh, coming to this uh, public outreach uh, session. Thank you very much.